May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Our text is our Old Testament reading from Genesis chapter 14, where we are told that these four kings took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. He must have thought to himself, how did it come to this? There I was, minding my own business, going about my business, Looked like I had a bright and prosperous future. And here I am now, captive, stolen away. And this bright future of mine is now a nightmare with no end or relief in sight. Well, of course, I'm talking about Lot, Abraham's nephew. When we last saw Lot, he and Abraham were going their separate ways, not because they had a falling out, but because both of them had so many flocks and herds that the one area that they were in couldn't support them. And so Abraham told Lot, we need to each find our own land and I will give you first choice. If you go right, I'll go left. If you go left, I'll go right. So Lot looked to the east. And he saw the Jordan Valley, lush and green, looking like the Garden of God, the Garden of Eden. And Lot chose that land, leaving Uncle Abraham with the less prosperous, less lush land in Canaan. So Lot, we are told, pitched his tent near Sodom. But we are also told that the residents of Sodom were very wicked in the eyes of the Lord. Well, it turns out that those residents of Sodom were taken captive. A coalition of kings attacked Sodom and Gomorrah and a few other cities because those cities had rebelled against those kings. And here, Lot, kind of as an innocent bystander, gets swept up in the conflict. We're told that Lot had actually moved into Sodom, and when the people of Sodom were taken captive, Lot and his family were scooped up as well. His bright future was looking very dark indeed. Well, of course, I'm talking about Lot, right? Well, yes and no. Lot's story is not that uncommon. Many people choose to pitch their tent near Sodom. It's the story of the high schooler who falls in with the wrong crowd. It's the story of the executive who starts to get greedy. It's the story of the spouse who engages in seemingly harmless flirtations. Well, often those stories end with the high schooler becoming hooked on drugs. The greedy executive being arrested for embezzlement, or the flirtatious spouse destroying two marriages and two families. Be careful where you pitch your tent. Lot had his eye on that lush pasture where he could grow his flocks and herds, he didn't give thought 
to what Sodom represented, the spiritual danger as well as any physical danger that would come with that place. And even though he may not have engaged in the wickedness of that city, he actually had moved into that city. And when it was attacked, he was taken up in the conflict. Be careful where you pitch your tent. And where is your tent pitched? Do you sometimes pitch your tent near Sodom? Do you tell yourself phrases like this? It's no big deal. Everybody does it. I can handle it. Just this one time. Those self-delusions will lead us through the city gates, right into the heart of Sodom. And before we know it, we, like Lot, are taken captive, not by four kings, but by sin and by Satan. Be careful where you pitch your tent. Well, word soon made it to Uncle Abraham that his nephew had been taken captive. And Abraham, without hesitation, musters his 318 trained men, as well as the men from three brothers with whom he had formed an alliance in Canaan. Now please note, although Lot had really shown great disrespect towards Abraham, he did not hesitate to work to save his kinsmen. He had allowed no resentment to fill his heart, and so he's quick to come up with a rescue plan. Note also that Abraham's outnumbered. Yes, he has 318 fighting men, we are told, as well as however many men those other three brothers contributed to the cause, but they are going up against a literal army. They are severely outmanned. Nevertheless, Abraham goes to rescue Lot, and he, he does a surprise sneak attack under the cover of darkness. And his smaller force of men is able to rout this larger army and drive them north where they are utterly defeated. And then Abraham is able to liberate his nephew and his family and the rest of the people of Sodom. Abraham's close to 80 years old. This man's worthy of an action figure. Well, if Lot is a picture of us and our inclination to pitch our tent near Sodom, then Abraham is a picture of Jesus. When humanity was taken captive in the persons of Adam and Eve, taken captive to Satan because of their rebellion, their disobedience in the Garden of Eden, when that happened, God was quick to devise a rescue plan. A rescue plan that would be carried out by his son, Jesus, who would, in the end, crush the head of Satan. Now, please note... Jesus held no ill will toward us, despite our tendency to lean toward Sodom. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us that, oh, a person might be willing to die for a righteous man, but God's love is demonstrated in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, Christ died for us because Humanly speaking, he was outnumbered. We're told that a large group of temple guards came to the, to the Garden of Gethsemane in order to take Jesus into custody. We're told that 
Aside from the one disciple who betrayed him, the other 11 fled from the garden, and then he was there alone. He stood alone before the Jewish ruling council called the Sanhedrin as they condemned him. He stood alone as the soldiers mocked him and beat him. He stood alone before Governor Pontius Pilate who had behind him the might of the entire Roman Empire. He stood alone as the mob cried out, crucify him. And when he was led to Calvary, he died alone. But it was under the cover of darkness that Jesus launched his own sneak attack. We're told that for three hours darkness covered the earth because the sun's light had been supernaturally snuffed out. And it was during those three hours that Satan, who had appeared so smug as he watched Jesus suffering, all of a sudden found himself engaged in battle against the Son of God. Jesus fought and struggled for you. And in the end, he was victorious. In the end, he had crushed the head of his enemy and ours, the devil. And Jesus, before he died, gave his victory cry of, It is finished. The suffering is done. The debt is paid. And you and I were released from Satan's captivity over us. Well, this same Jesus, who was victorious on Mount Calvary, will return again in victory. He is that rider on the white horse that John describes in Revelation chapter 19. He is the one who comes with his mighty army. He is the one whose robe is dipped in his own sacrificial blood, but whose robe will also be dipped in the crimson, deep red blood of his enemies. Just as Abraham drove that army to the north and defeated them, so Jesus will drive his enemies, Satan and his allies, into the eternally burning lake of fire. And when Jesus returns, he will bring us from this world, deliver us from this world into the world to come, his everlasting kingdom. Yes, our Lord Jesus has won the victory on Mount Calvary, and that victory will be complete when he returns in glory on the last day. Sadly, however, for Lot, he didn't learn a thing. Lot moved back to Sodom, to the place not just of physical, but of spiritual peril. Sodom, along with its twin city of Gomorrah, would ultimately fall under divine judgment. And although God would spare Lot and his family, Lot would still suffer. Because, as you might recall, Lot's wife turned back towards Sodom and was turned into a pillar of salt. And Lot and his daughters had to flee into the mountains. He had not learned the important lesson of being careful where you pitch your tent. Don't let his bad decision be your bad decision. Remember that your Savior Jesus has fought and bled and died and rose for you. He has delivered you the victory and has rescued you from your captivity to sin and to Satan. Do not once again pitch your tent near Sodom. 
Rather, pitch your tent on Calvary's Mount at the foot of the cross of Jesus. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>